Good evening and welcome to the uh, Ogden City Council meeting for February 5th, 2014. Uh, let the roll call reflect that uh, all council members are present with the exceptions of Vice Chair Gochner and uh, Council Member Blair who have both asked to be excused. Um, council Member Wicks, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure. Thank you. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and we will now observe a moment of silence. Thank you. The uh, first um, item on our agenda today uh, is the approval of the minutes. Uh, the first item is minutes of the regular meeting of December 3rd. Um, Council Member Garner? Yes, Chair Heyer, I've reviewed those minutes and found them to be correct. And the minutes of the joint study session of January 28th, 2014, Council Member Stevens. Yes, Mr. Chair, I've reviewed those and I make a motion that we accept the minutes that have been presented. Second. Okay, we've got a, uh, um, a motion and a second for approval of the minutes. And this is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Next item is uh, the new business, beekeeping ordinance. And uh, for your information there, the ordinance that was uh, noticed last week, um, there has been some, uh, some tweaking to some of the language. And the, uh, the new proposed language was on the uh, Will Diaz outside. And I think if you were able to pick that up, you, that's where that was and uh, it will be considered tonight. So if you want to make your, uh, to give input regarding that, uh, it will be uh, kind of pointed out in the, in the presentations. So um, I think we're gonna be looking for Mr. Montgomery to make a presentation around that. Is that where we're starting? Oh, oh okay. Ms. Eller-Smith, thank you. Chair Hire, council members. Appreciate this opportunity. As you know, um, we've been working for a couple of months on um, a bee ordinance. Chair Heyer asked, uh, this is one of his initiatives, and he asked that we address this back in July or August. And uh, I didn't know anything about beekeeping, but I learned it's a pretty hot topic. Um, did a lot of research. Um, in fact, there'd been some planning articles in the U Utah American Planning Association's <coughs> journal, lots of web stories about the loss of bees uh, across the nation. And in our fall meeting in the Utah League of Cities and Towns, there was a round table regarding the regulation of bees. And Craig Hall, who has provided legal services for the council in the past, uh, made that presentation. Um, the, the first um, discussion he talked about is whether or not you want to regulate them on all. And after some brief discussions with the council, we decided to go ahead and pull together an ordinance. We looked at uh, model ordinances from Louisiana and Wisconsin, and also local ordinances from Provo and Ogden, Midvale, um, I'm sorry, Provo and Salt Lake City, uh, Midvale and South Jordan. The, the differences in a lot of these ordinances focus primarily on the location of hives, so where they are located on the property line and the density, basically how many hives you could have on a particular lot size. Um, so what you have before you, we, we came up with, with kind of a, um, follows primarily um, Provo and Salt Lake's ordinance with regard to setbacks and requirements. And I'll just briefly um, go over what was proposed. Uh, the agenda shows two, um, or options um, for the council to consider. And as Chair Heyer recommended there's, or um, mentioned, there's yet another one that we'd um, like to propose as well. The difference between the two options that of the shown on the agenda is simply the number of hives that are allowed. Um, the largest, the, the initial um, option A 
has up to five hives for up to half an acre and 10 hives for a half acre or more. And option B just allows for the smaller lots up to 7,500 square feet, it, feet, it would limit those to two hives. The ordinance itself um, that would initially just amend the current B ordinance, bees are allowed in the city and have been allowed for a long time, but because of the um, requirement that this, the structure be kept 75 feet from any dwelling or house, it pretty much limited any uh, use of it in, in any of the lots in the city. So we'd be amending the, the keeping structures for animals 12-7-6 uh, just to remove the section on bees. Uh, and then we would be adding a new chapter for Title 13 uh, just called beekeeping. It, it um, addresses several definitions, probably the most important of which is a flyway barrier, and that's defined as a solid wall, fence, or dense vegetation that directs the flight pattern of the bees at least six feet above ground level over property lines in the vicin vicinity of the apiary. And that's, of course, just to make sure that uh, people on the streets or, or sidewalks aren't um, getting bombarded by bees. Um, it just identifies the purpose to authorize beekeeping. It uh, sets um, requirements for hives on residential lots, and that's the option A, option B, so the, the number, the density uh, that's allowed, and specifically states that if you live on a lot that you don't own, that you need written permission from the owner um, of that property before you can have bees. Um, it has a section on hive construction um, and just requires that the colonies hive, uh, be kept in hives with removable frames and uh, addresses placement, that they shall, shall, shall not be located in the front yard, that they be at least 25 years, <laughs> sorry, 25 feet from an adjoining property line or public street unless shielded by a flyway barrier um, or if shielded by a flyway barrier, then they can be within five feet from an adjoining property line. It addresses rooftop hives. This is something that was not addressed in any of the um, other ordinances that we researched, but um, it was a recommendation from um, our attorney, Mark Stratford, that we do this because um, there, we think there's some rooftop hives in the city and so we thought this was appropriate. Um, the design just wanted to make sure that uh, hives are at least six inches above the ground and that they sh they're not exceed seven feet in overall height from the ground or the rooftop level and that a supply of fresh water be maintained at all times, again, to reduce any nuisance. Um, it requires that hives be operated and maintained as provi provided in the Utah Bee Inspection Act. Um, which, um, and then also that each hive be conspicuously marked with the owner's name, address, telephone number, and state registration number. And that's required by the Bee Inspection Act. We just called that out um, in our own ordinance as well. We want beekeepers to be registered with, with the state. Um, and if at any time there's a conflict between county ordinance and city ordinance, the most uh, restrictive regulations would apply. Uh, we've put in civil penalties, and I'm going to ask um, Mayor Brown, our um, Chief Deputy uh, City Attorney, to address the civil penalties. And following her, then, um, I'd like uh, Greg Montgomery to kind of talk about the changes that, we, that have been proposed in the substitute ordinance. Okay, Chair, higher members of the Council. Just to explain a little bit about the penalty provision, um, unless it's called out in, in an ordinance, the default uh, would be that ordinances are enforced as a Class B misdemeanor. So this calls it out that it's actually enforced similar to other zoning code violations. It starts off with a notice of violation and then there's a 10-day um, a warning period and when that expires, if the uh, violation has not been fixed, then then code enforcement can uh, issue a penalty and that starts off at $125 and goes up from there. But like any of our code enforcement, the goal is to uh, hope that the uh, 
the owner will come into compliance with the code, and so that's why there's there's an initial notice period and an opportunity to correct that. This provision also incorporates um, the nuisance provision under Title 12, Chapter 8 of the code, and, and that just mentions that there's another applicable section if uh, the bee keeping operation maybe is abandoned or becomes a nuisance, um, then that can also be enforced through this ordinance. So if it if it is likened to um, you know garbage or refuse or just somebody kind of leaves those structures on the property and they're they're not being used and they become a hazard to adjacent property owners, um, it just mentions that uh, that would be considered a violation and it would also be enforced through the civil penalty process. So are there any questions on the on the enforcement or penalties? Okay. Any questions for? Her? Hey, thank you. Thank you. Chair, higher members of the council, uh, it mention it was mentioned of the uh, substitute ordinance that uh, has been provided to you this evening. Mm -hmm. As uh, I sat down with. Uh, Mara and uh, discuss some of the uh, maybe zoning and and uh, property concerns that the language has. We suggested some some tweaking to the ordinance to make sure that we look at this as being uh, a, a fair and equitable ordinance, both for the beekeeper and for the neighbors adjacent to it. And we saw some some language in there that, uh, knowing how people work, sometimes the way you write it, uh, there always be someone trying to do something differently and. So we thought it'd be important to make some tweaks just so it's clear on what some of the uh, provisions are. One of the uh, key things that we've, we've looked at is uh, in defining uh, streets, property lines, um, the impacts that, be, that could be given uh, with, with the hives and how some people may take advantage of it to uh, agitate their neighbor. Uh, that does happen sometimes. We have, have received complaints that way before. And how to make this work for, for everyone in the city. One of the first corrections we've made is just the concept that we had used a public street. And just clarifying that, that like all other measurements, we generally define it from property line, which in this case would be the public right-of-way line. Some could argue that, that the word public street would mean where the curb is, where the pavement is. And the public property still can extend anywhere from 15 to 28 feet behind that curb line. Mr. Burger, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you know your doodling that you did in our work in our study session was really good. Well, out the uh, doodling, okay. We were okay. able to do that for the public as well. It clarified what you were saying very well. Make sure I find where I put the doodling. Okay. Okay, so the, the, the first idea we're looking at of a small word revision is the idea of public street versus the public right-of-way. Generally, here's your curb line, the street is located here, whatever it refers to. Most people never really think of the area from the curb line to property line as being part of the street. And so if it's read by some that I can have my hive 25 feet from the street, that may put it on property line or could even put it on public property because the 25 distance, foot distance from the curb line could, could actually work that way. But in all streets, there is a, a, a right-of-way line that says all property, this is public property, behind that is private property. And so the clarification of the public right-of-way is to make sure the measurements take place where the property line is rather than where the, the street surface is. So that's the very first clarification that we're proposing uh, to add as a, uh, a revision to either option you look at tonight. The next one we looked at is the issue of um, the flyaway barriers <coughs> and location of, of hives. For example, in this drawing, we take a look at a corner lot. 
and we took a look at if this is a street and this is a street, here's the house, and someone says, okay, I'm gonna put my hives here, their entrance is facing away from the public street, the flyaway barrier I'll put over here, therefore, these could be all open and exposed five feet from the property line, so it's visible to everyone as they drive up and down the street. Really, in, in situations for neighborhood, we, you really don't want to be looking at those type of things from the street. You want to have some privacy. And so the other revision we made is that flyaway barrier is, is to the closest property lines so that then you actually get some screening taking place, whether it be a fence, whether it be shrubs, something so that this is softened and so the neighbors don't have to look at, at that. Especially this is, is when you have a corner yard, side yard on the street. Interior lots, they don't have that much problem. Generally, there's other screening taking place, but we felt because that situation could, could take place, that the flyway barriers are adjacent to the closest property lines where those hives are located at. As you get further away, then, you know, this may be 50 feet to that property line, so the flyway barrier is not that important at that point. We also looked at the idea that the flyaway barrier is not needed um, if you're 25 feet back and going towards the public street. Again, by that time, you've got the, the trees, three trees and everything else that's taking place. And so we've removed that idea that, that you need, uh, that if you're set back to 25 feet, uh, you, could, you could orient towards the street and not have a problem that way. Because you have really, the trees and everything else that act as your buffers are out in the street already. The other revision that we, we made is that those hive entrances and their orientation, instead of uh, being away from the nearest property line or public street, revise that again. If you're, if you're back here and that's the nearest property line and you've got another 30 or 40 feet here, again, that's not a real critical issue to have a flyaway barrier there. The real key thing is how close are you to your adjacent property? adjacent dwellings. That's where the, the major impact would be. And so we, we tweaked the wording to talk about uh, from the nearest adjacent dwelling in terms of the hive entrance orientation rather than maybe the rear property line or, or the property line per se. But we really want to make sure that we don't impact the adjacent neighbors. And so that is the other proposed revision we're making that uh, that orientation be uh, based on the adjacent dwelling, not the property line or public street. Those are the uh, items that we're proposing to be uh, substituted in either uh, option that you look at tonight. Um, there was, could be some discussion of how do we feel as, as far as administration, the, the uh, five uh, or the two, you know, 7,500 square feet and two, or just five hives and then a half acre, you get up to the 10. With the, the setbacks and all the other regulations that this ordinance is proposing, uh, we feel that either one is, is appropriate. It doesn't matter because these distances and that will, will help regulate based on lot sizes. Rather than trying to dictate a lot size and then make sure everything happens, the setbacks will dictate how many can really take place on those lots. That's so we don't see a need to, to the, the five is is fine. Any questions for Mr. Montgomery? Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Eller Smith, w w when we had a discussion, you said you had spoken with someone in Salt Lake about their uh, number of hives and why they chose five and ten. That, that might be pertinent. Yeah, I didn't speak to anybody, but I pulled up um, their their staff memo on the information um, and what it indicated, um, the reason they picked this number. They said the number of five hives being allowed on a property was suggested as a maximum number allowed because of the need for beekeepers to consolidate hives at the end of the year in case of weak colonies. The combining of weak colonies can better ensure the bees' survival through the winter, and I think that's something that you've raised too. Uh, we've got some issues with, with bees um, not making it or, or getting the hives getting sick, and so uh, a higher number would, would allow you know, for that. Okay. Um, I just wanted to let you know, so now basically from a uh, procedural standpoint, you have 
uh, a few options. Um, you can take action on option A or option B, or you can substitute this, uh, this for option A, which is the substitute. Um, you could amend the substitute to include the lower number if you felt that was appropriate. Um, so those are kind of your options, and, and I know that you probably want to take public input before you make some decision. Thank you. Okay, we will now receive public input on this item. If you have something you'd like to, to say to the council, come to the microphone, give us your name and address, and limit your comments to three minutes, please. Thank you very much. My name is David Stacy. I live at 810 Tyler Circle here in Ogden. I am a bee owner. My wife and I uh, have had several beehives. Uh, some of them got struggled by some of our problems, but uh, uh, we're here in a positive mode because we are just tickled that you took this one on. Uh, without it, we would not have hives in our yard. Uh, so we did get a, put a letter together and uh, I would like, if you, for your permission, just to read this because we're going to give this to you. But most of the things I asked for could be given if we uh, go with the upper hives or the five hives in the backyard. Uh, as a beehive owner and uh, future beehive owners, we are greatly concerned with the restrictive regulatory requirements of the city of Ogden. As we research the value of the honeybee in our in our environment, we are convinced that having honeybees in individual yards is not only a wise decision, but it's a necessity. Uh, we applaud their efforts to create a law that would allow individual homeowners to, to have beehives in their yards, but we do question uh, the law that would limit the homeowners to just two beehives for many of the same reasons that, that were talked about. When you have two healthy hives and, and you know, you're not, you're probably okay, but if you have two hives that aren't healthy and you have to have two other hives to, to get us through, we, we just need that extra barrier to make sure we have it. And, and really four or five hives in an area is, is really a, a well done. But um, because of the concerns, uh, we, uh, we are opposed to the law that would have just two hives. Uh, a law that would uh, require a reasonable barrier, a reasonable distance to, uh, for a fly zone, and flexible number of hives would be applauded. We'd, we'd uh, go along with that completely. Uh, we urge you to respect our desires because I have 58 signatures of homeowners in about a three block area, and they all love the bees, you know, and I, I would uh, uh, urge you to continue the effort, and I urge you to do the five rather than the two. Okay, Mr. Stacy, if you would give that letter to our recorder, and uh, it will go on the record that way, that would be wonderful. Thank you for your comments. <clears throat> Thank you, our city council. I'm Flo Stacy, and I'm the original owner of the Beehives. And we was under the assumption that we had to only have 50 feet, so I had four hives. Or excuse me two hives for four years before I even knew I was in contempt or whatever you want to call it. And uh, well, it we should just say what well, you were in violation. Maybe. Uh, okay. In violation. <laughs> that we, we don't hold you in contempt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So after I got through or they made me move my hives, which it, it, and the final end killed my hives. They wanted to moved when it was too hot. And they give me two weeks, and I still had to have them moved because the city was going to find me. And I called uh, Utah State University, worked with them. They told me it was too hot to move them. We moved them to another area. They stayed for a while. They got black mold because it wasn't the environment that I had at my house. Moved them again, and I lost every one of my hives. My hives produced 225 pounds of honey in my backyard. They were moved to to the fact my neighbor turned me in. But that's beside the point. Um, uh, so I started doing some research. There are 1,728 registered hives from Centerville to Provo, 38 registered hives in Ogden because apparently they were better at finding out the, the rules and the regulations. And uh, then, and get ready for this one. There are 27 hives that you know nothing about 
in a three mile radius from my house. No names will be given <laughs> and has have had them for five to six years. And it just doesn't make sense to not let us continue and do, and, and I love your new regulations, I really do, but there is some pretty strong findings that people won't register their hives in Ogden because once they're on file, you guys all come out and inspect us and check us. I am registered and have been from day one, and they can come and check me out at any time they want. I have plenty of property, I have water. I don't think my bees even leave my yard, but maybe. <laughs> and that's all I have to say, and thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question for you. So do you register with the city or the with state. the state? The Department of I Agriculture. I didn't register with the city, but I will I don't think right you do. Now. That's why I'm asking you. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? I have my license with me if you need it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Nate Hall, and I am co-owner of Deseret Hive Supply here in Ogden. Um, obviously, the benefits of beekeeping don't need to be discussed. I think we're all understanding the benefits of the bees here. Uh, I just wanted to talk some specifics about the code. Um, as an avid beekeeper, um, I am even a little confused on this whole flyaway section that you have in here. Um, I understand exactly, you know, the language and what a flyaway wall is and, and what we're talking about, but um, I think that those space requirements might be a little off. Um, having been around bees for a long time and even uh, in urban environments, beekeeping, uh, it's my professional opinion that uh, no more than 10 feet is, is necessary for bees to get up and away and disperse in a, a matter that is uh, safe for pedestrian traffic or, or anything else of the sort. And so um, that might be an area that requires further discussion is, is to make that um, easier for residents to locate hives on their own properties. Um, the suggestion of basing that distance off of neighboring dwellings versus property lines is, is definitely a good one. Um, number of hives is the other issue I wanted to talk about. As, as a beekeeper, our number of hives always fluctuates. It depends on obviously the time of the year, how, how hard of a winter it was, different, different factors like that, um, drought, different things like that. So number of hives is always fluctuating just as the hive size itself is fluctuating. Um, it is also my professional opinion that four hives is the perfect for a hobbyist backyard beekeeper. We ha it's not common, I mean it is not uncommon, excuse me, for us to have up to 75% winter loss. And that being the case, if you have that one hive that makes it through the winter, you can then split that hive back up to, and get your numbers back up without having to purchase additional packages of bees. So um, four would really be, if this were my code that I was writing, four would be kind of that, that minimum. Um, and I think that's all that I want to address if anyone has any questions for me. Okay, I have a, a really weird question, but how do hi are, do you set hives like this, or do you put them straight up, yes, or, or so, and or all of the above? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Hives hives grow um, vertically as far as the amount of honey that's in them. Um, as far as spacing horizontally, there is not a, a, a minimum requirement of space, so they can be directly next to each other. Um, it's very common commercially for thousands of hives to, hives to be in a small, you know, area. And how big are they? Like two feet, five feet? Um, yeah. 18 uh, inches? Uh, feet. There you go. Like, Ask the woodworker. half by two feet. <laughs> if yeah. Rich builds them. <laughs> yeah. No, he builds them by the standard length straw hive dimension, so that's the industry standard. But thanks. Thank you. <laughs> they do have bigger ones. I, I, I've never seen them. Uh, uh, big, bigger than than the regular Langstroth? Yeah, they have. Yeah, I saw them at IGA. Oh, is a big. Yeah. Well, oh, that's top the top bar. bar. Yeah, that's a different type of a hive. Yeah. There's actually fewer bees in a top bar than there is in a regular hive. It's just spread out a little bit more. Any other comments? When will this law go into effect? Because I need to bring my bees home. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll get to that. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Stacy. Yes, come forward, please. 
Uh, uh, later, yes. We're going to deal with this ordinance right now, and then there will be some other opportunities for public comment later on the topic of your, cho of your choosing. That. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Well, that uh, looks like it. we've exhausted the public input. Um, what's the pleasure of the council? I... I uh, looks like we have some uh, substitute uh, language for the ordinance. Um, and with regards to uh, in the, in the uh, definition section, um, number three, where the where, uh, administration has recommended hive entrances shall be oriented away from the nearest adjacent dwelling um, like Mr. Montgomery indicated in, in the study session uh, as, as I've digested that comment um, that people will complain because it's that way I, I think I think it's our responsibility to to address the safety issues and not irrational fears and and therefore I, I think there ought to be some kind of a distance associated with with that adjacent dwelling I, and I think less than 25 feet is an appropriate addition in that in that language um, just the nature of bees um, that that protects the beekeeper and you know it might not help people's irrational fears but I think it will address the real issues so you would maybe say hive entrances should shall be oriented away from the nearest adjacent dwelling if it is unless if less than 25 feet than 25 feet from the hive yeah. okay I, I think that's a i think that's reasonable i just really do other than that those those other uh, tweaks in the language looked very they they clarified uh, what was intended in the ordinance in the first place, and I think they were absolutely appropriate. Nate brought up about the uh, flyway barrier. Uh, is that still adequate for what we're talking about here? Sure. Uh, yeah, it defines the flyway barrier and its placement pretty well in here, I think. I think that was. Should be six clear. feet. Yeah. Six feet high, yeah. I think the only people that, that would bother is somebody that's eight foot tall. If there were, you know, so that's the idea is to get the bees above head height in a distance. So, so. Well, I'll make a stab at this then, Chair Heyer. Um, with the additional language for substitute ordinance option A, with the less than 25 feet, I'll make a motion that we adopt ordinance 2014-7. I second it. Okay, we have a motion uh, made by Councilmember Garner and seconded by Councilmember Stevens for adoption of the ordinance. Um, and this is a voice vote. And this Mr. is a roll call vote. Just to clarify, yes, there, there was an amendment to the substitute as well. Right. So, that so we so we do need to, do want, to articulate that. It it was included in the motion. Just so that everyone's So clear. maybe for the recorder's benefit, it's under 13-4-4, under Hive Construction, Medication, and Water Supply, um, under Item 3. Um, in that section, it reads, Hive entrances shall be oriented away from the nearest adjacent, adjacent dwelling, dwelling <coughs> if less than 25 feet, feet from the hive. Correct. Okay. Is, that, is the motion clear? Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, this is a roll call vote. Councilmember Gardner. Aye. Councilmember Stevens. Aye. Councilmember White. Aye. Councilmember Wicks. Aye. Chair Heyer. Aye. That passes. And I believe that for Mrs. Stacy's benefit, this goes into effect immediately. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> oh, uh, we thank you for coming and giving us your input. And, uh, for waiting for the time for us to get to this point. We appreciate that. Thank you so much.
Okay, the next item uh, on our uh, new business agenda is a cancellation of a meeting. Consider a cancellation a meeting of uh, March 18th. I, Chair Heyer, I would make a motion that we cancel the regular meeting scheduled for March 18th, 2014. I second it. Okay, we have a motion to cancel by Council Member Wicks, seconded by Council Member White for cancellation. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, okay, that passes. This is a uh, time for public comment. This is an opportunity to address the council regarding your concerns or ideas. Please state your name and address clearly for the record and limit your comments to three minutes. This would be a good time for you. But yeah, come up to the come up, up to, to the, the mic uh, and chair higher. In upstate New York, they put beehives on tall, tall buildings, real tall buildings. You got a whole bunch of real tall buildings here, and they could sit up there on top of Wells Fargo Bank and have no indifference to it because they can fly. <coughs> Jerry Steinfeld would probably uh, say good things about it too. Um, I have a problem. I have a property over here. Did you give us your name and address, please? Warren Carnes. Okay. K A R N S. I am a manager of a property in a very bad section of town. We have an unbelievable amount of crime over there. My vehicle last night got busted into. I had to kick out a few persons. And the drugs are rampant there. You have a lot of vacant buildings here that you could probably put up these people and make something of them. Um, I've got a lot of homeless people here, and I have like eight or ten persons in each one of the apartments over there. You can't keep them away. I'm constantly kicking people out, and there's fights and stabbings and all sorts of things. The police are over there all the time. You don't seem to do anything about it, and they said, please disregard it. My car got busted into last night, and it cost me $2,500 today to get that repaired. The thing is, there's so many homeless people over there, there's no place for them to be. They can't get into the shelter over there. There's oh, tons of vacant buildings around here that could put these people up and maybe control them, you know what I mean? Do something for them. I'm at 503 26th Street over there, a real nasty section of town, and all the buildings around there. Crime is rampant, it's bad. I had a tussle with somebody last night at one o'clock, and we finally captured the person around three o'clock in the morning, breaking into vehicles just on the building above, including my vehicle. This is happening every single night. I wish I had problems with bees. They're easy to handle. People who think they can just camp out in the building that's a difficult situation. We need to make a place, not a, a, a paintball place over there on Pacific, uh, whatever it is. We need to actually make a building here, house these people, put them up, give them some skills, give them something to do. Because all they're doing is doing drugs and, and beating up on each other and stuff. I don't like getting beat up every third or fourth night handling two or three people. It's no fun. And I'm sure plenty of persons that live over in that same area, if they work, they're in the minority. Can we do something about this? You know what I mean? It's a real situation, you know? Yeah, thank you. Um, we will address your issue. Any, Mayor, do you have anything you'd like to Say, Mr. Carr. I appreciate you coming and expressing your concerns. I know that's a, a key address for the police department. You mentioned that they're there quite a bit, and we keep a very close eye on that over there. So we'll readdress this with the chief of police. And uh, again, I appreciate your comments. It's of concern to all of us as well. Well, the cops, the crooks, and everybody knows each other on each side of the team there, but they, they scatter like uh, rats when they come, and it's it's... It's becoming a little bit too difficult to live over there now. I wish they would do, if nothing else, take them down to jail and, and book them as a John Doe, even if they know who they are, so they can maybe run a couple warrants on them, you know? 
This guy last night had six warrants on him. Well, thank you, Mr. Carnes. Okay. Appreciate your time. You have an excellent night. Uh huh. Anyone else? Good luck when you're beating. Thank you. Good luck with your drugs. Welcome. <clears throat> Hi. Dan Schroeder, 1444 Binford Street, and I'd like to thank Amy Sue for printing this for me because uh, I don't have a color printer. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the City Council, you are about to be pummeled in your work session tonight with 264 pages of numbers and graphs. Nobody will blame you if you don't pay attention to every single number and data point, but I'd like to draw your attention to one small portion of just one of the graphs. This is the fifth slide in the presentation from your financial consultants. It's page 248 in your work session packets. It shows the cash balance in the water utility fund expressed as the number of days of working cash. The yellow line is what your consultants predicted in May 2012. And I've highlighted their prediction for the most recently ended year, that is for last June 30. The prediction was that at that time, the water fund would have a balance equivalent to 176 days of working cash just under six months. The actual value shown in red was approximately a full year of working cash, six months more than was predicted. In dollars, that's a difference of about five million. So your consultants were off by six months worth of cash and that prediction was made only 14 months in advance. Their prediction wasn't just wrong, it was spectacularly wrong. If I were them, I'd be more than a little embarrassed. Of course, everyone makes mistakes. I've certainly made my share over the years. The important question going forward is whether you've learned from your mistakes. In this case, do we understand why the prediction was off by six months' worth of working cash? And do we have any reason to believe that the new predictions going forward over the next 10 years will be any more accurate? If not, then it's a waste of your time to be looking at these slides, and you can all go home early tonight. I think I know why that prediction was so inaccurate, but I can't explain it in three minutes. I'd be happy to discuss it with any of you, or your administration, or your consultants, or anyone else who's interested. I think you all know how to reach me. Instead, for now, I'm going to have some fun and stick my own neck out with a prediction. If you look ahead to the next data point on the red graph, you'll see that your consultants are now predicting that by this coming June 30, four months from now, your days of working cash will have come down to about 290. I say they're wrong again. In fact, I predict that by this June 30, the water fund will have 500 days of working cash, well off the top of the chart. Of course, I could be wrong. My prediction is based on the numbers in your packet without the benefit of being able to talk with your staff and make sure that I'm interpreting the numbers correctly. But if I am wrong, I look forward to learning where I went astray and incorporating that knowledge into a better prediction for next year. Meanwhile, I hope you and your consultants will adopt that same attitude and try to learn from your mistakes. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Seeing none, we'll uh, entertain comments from the mayor. I think at this time, thank you. And council members. Well, I'd just like to, to thank the staff and, uh, and administration for working on the B ordinance. It's, uh, it is not the end of the world. You know, it's not as important as uh, starving children and some of those kind of things, but, um, but bees are, are, an, are an endangered species, and uh, it is important that we uh, regulate them in such a way that, that encourages beekeepers to, to adopt that as a hobby and so that we can uh, continue to pollinate our trees and our vegetables and uh, neighbors around bee hives tend to really appreciate the bees much less than fear them because they see the uh, increase in their in their gardens and whatnot so appreciate the the time that it's taken to put put this together thank you very much okay I look for a motion to adjourn I'll second it okay you got a motion uh, by Councilmember Garner seconded by Councilmember Wicks to adjourn all in favor aye any opposed Okay, we will have a city council work session immediately following this uh, where there will be many topics discussed uh, and so if you're interested to join us in the in the work session room. <laughs>